Welcome to another class in construction scheduling and today we're going to start talking about one of the scheduling techniques which is the activity on arrow also known as arrow diagramming method so sometimes it's referred to as AOA activity on arrow or sometimes also referred to as ADM arrow diagramming method so what's the arrow diagramming method how does it work what are these calculations this is basically what we're going to be discussing in this lecture we're going to have an introduction to what this uh, scheduling technique is and what's the advantage of this scheduling technique. We're going to talk about the network diagram and some common issues related to its use. Network calculations, which is basically used to establish the dates for the network. And then we're going to discuss another elaboration or another uh, iteration in improvement of scheduling techniques, which is called the time scaled network. And then finally, we're going to talk about units of time. The activity on arrow network is the first developed networking method. We started talking about scheduling techniques. We talked about a um, checklist. Basically, you write down all the activities that you need to do. And it's not necessarily in order. It does not show any dependency among these activities. And it does not show any duration for these activities. So it's just a matter of listing the activities. And once you've done each one of them, you check it with a check mark so at the end it can be used as a planning tool and as a control tool by looking at the checked activities but again as you can see the drawbacks of this technique it does not show duration does not show dependency or order of the activities another technique was the Gantt chart or the bar chart which was a great development because now it showed in a graphical format the different activities which showed um, on two axes, a vertical axis showing the activities and the horizontal axis is a time line showing when does each activity start and finish so you can trace a bar or a line representing the duration of the activity so the activities are drawn in a scale that shows their relative duration however, and that's that technique by the way is still very commonly used today in construction uh, projects and any other project as well the main drawback of that technique is that it does not show the dependency among the activities. Yes, it shows when each one should start and when each one is expected to finish or planned to finish, but it does not show what's the interrelationship among these activities. What if one of them was delayed? How is that going to affect the others? That is not shown on the Gantt chart. Trying to do that, as we're going to see by the end of this lecture, by adding links might create something that's really hard to, to read. So someone started thinking about a new graphical method of representing the activities. How are we going to develop that schedule? And they started thinking about the flow of water, for example, from the source until it reaches your house. How it goes from a large plant through a uh, smaller one, through pipes and pumping stations and so on. And these pipes start branching from a main pipe to a secondary pipe until they reach the very fine pipes that are in your house and then finally once this water is used and you need to collect it back the used water it's done in a reverse way again from smaller pipes to larger ones until they reach the uh, sewage treatment plant so we have junctions we have pipes we have connections and they show the dependency if for example there's no water in this pipe then the following one's not going to have any water either. So the activity on arrow is the first developed networking method, like a network of, of water distribution or collection. This is basically what we have. It's also called the IJ or arrow diagramming method. Why is it called the IJ? Because each activity is going to be represented by two nodes, the start node of the activity and the finish node of the activity. And the activity itself is going to be the line or the arrow connecting between these two nodes. So in this case, the activity is going to be represented by a node I, representing its start, and a node J, representing its finish. And the activity itself is IJ, the line that bridges between these two nodes. Each activity is represented by an arrow spanning between two nodes, representing the start and finish events of the activity. So the activities are linked from the finish of one activity to the start of the next one through a node. Therefore, the finish of one activity, the node representing the finish of one activity is exactly the same as 
the node representing the start of the activity that follows it. So activities are stated on the arrow. The name of the activity or the description of the activity is going to be mentioned or written on the arrow. So we know what activity IJ means. Nodes have no duration and use no resources. The node is just a date. It does not have a duration. It's an event. This is the start event. This is the finish event. The I node marks the beginning of the activity, whereas the J node marks its completion. And the network always, remember that very well, the network always flows from left to right. Therefore, even if you have in these nodes numbers, let's say node uh, 3, 5, or 7, 12, or whatever, the number itself does not mean anything. It's just a matter of order. And you can have, for example, the numbers in a reverse order or any other order. As long as we know that the network flows from left to right, this is how we read the network as we are progressing. So here, for example, we have the node I, we have this, the finished node J, and the arrow or the activity itself representing uh, uh, whatever description that might be. And underneath the arrow, we're going to put the duration of that activity. J should be bigger than I. When we're talking about dates, then this date is going to be later than that one. Or sometimes it might be the same date as we're going to see very shortly. Activities are related to each other through nodes. Activity 2030 cannot start until activity 1020 is complete. Here, for example, we have activity 1020, which is also known as activity A, and activity 2030, which is also known as activity B. Activity A has a duration of 5 days, B has a duration of 10 days. What if activity 1020 or A has not started, then definitely 2030 cannot start either. So we say in this case that activity 2030 depends on activity 1020. Now, can there be more than one activity depending on one? Yes. So for example, we can have a starting node, node 10, and from this node we have three activities starting at the same time. So these activities have the same start date, but they might have different finish dates. Activity A is going to finish on day 5, B is going to finish on day 10, and C is going to finish on day 12. So all of these started from the same node. Similarly, several activities can merge into one node as well. So when two or more activities merge into a node, here we have, for example, activity 20, 40, 30, 40, and 40, 40, of course, there should be that. That's a probably a typo. We should have put here 50 instead of 40 because you should not have 40 and 40 as the start and finish of the same activity. So this is a typo. This should be either 40, 50 or 50, 40. Once the dependencies have been established among the activities, a network diagram can be constructed. That's why the first effort is not going to be to draw the network. The first effort first is going to be to analyze the activities, to define what these activities are, and then to start thinking logically about their dependencies and about their uh, order of occurrence. Once we have established that, we can start drawing the network. The former activity is called a predecessor or preceding activity, whereas the dependent activity is called the successor or succeeding activity. So in the previous examples, for example, we had three nodes, 10, 20, and 30. Activity 10, 20 is a predecessor to activity 2030 or is also called a preceding activity to activity 2030 and also activity 2030 is going to be called a successor to activity 1020 or a succeeding activity to activity 1020 so from now on we're not going to say the activity before or the activity after we're going to use the new lingo which we're going to represent it as either predecessors and successors to a certain activity. A network should start with a single node and end with a single node. That's another convention of drawing the network, like it flows from left to right. Another issue here is that it's going to have one starting node and one finishing node, so we're going to have several activities maybe merging, emerging from one node and several activities merging into one node at the end. To look at an example here, activity on arrow network dependencies. So what we have, 
what you as a project manager do is develop that table that shows what are the activities based on the work breakdown structure and then what are the dependencies among these activities and we can work either in what's called forward chaining or backward chaining some schedulers start by visualizing the site a blank site blank slate there's nothing there and they start what's the first activity that I'm gonna do and then they keep following that with successors other schedulers look at the completed project and they say okay I can visualize the complete complete project now what's the last activity that's gonna happen what should happen before that and before that and before that and they do it they do it in what's called reverse chaining or reverse order the good schedulers the professional ones can do both at the same time so they can look at any activity and can immediately visualize what should occur before this one and what is going to follow that one so what should be the predecessors and what should be the successors in this table since we're just starting here we have the activities and we're looking on IPAs IPA means immediately preceding activity the activity that immediately occurs before this one so from this table here activity A has no IPAs no immediate preceding activities therefore this is going to be our first activity activity B has A as an immediate preceding activity and so does C so obviously activity A is going to be branching into two activities B and C activity D is going to follow activity B and activity E is going to follow both C and D so based on this logic let's try to draw this network you should do that on a piece of paper another example here is a little bit more sophisticated so we have activity A doesn't have any predecessors and B does not have any predecessors either. So again, here we're going to have one node branching into two activities. Activity A and activity B. And then you have the rest of the network to draw showing also depends on is another way of saying IPA or immediate preceding activity. Now we come to a very interesting issue, one of the unique features of arrow diagramming methods. Dummy activities. Now, let's say I have two activities starting at the same time, finishing at the same time, having the same predecessor, and having the same successor. Very interesting. Again, two activities starting at the same time, finishing at the same time, having the same immediate predecessor and having the same immediate successor. Let's think about it for just a second. So if we say that the predecessor is activity 1020 and the successor is activity 3040. Common predecessor, common successor. And then the two activities occurring at the same time. They will start at the same time after the completion of node 20. So node 20 is going to be their start. And they're going to end at the same time and lead to the following activity 3040. So their finished node is node 30. How are we going to distinguish between these two activities? Because when we look at them, both of them have the same designation, activity 2030. So we have 1020, 2030, 2030, and 3040. How are we going to distinguish between these two 2030s? So in this case the only way to do that is to add some unreal activities or virtual activities or what we're going to call dummy activities so dummy activities are unreal activities depicted by dashed lines the dashed lines means that they do not have any real duration the real duration of this dummy activity is zero it can occur when two or more activities share the same predecessor and the same successor therefore making their start and finish nodes the same they have zero duration and no resources are assigned to them. So that's a feature of the dummy activities. They can be critical activities and are otherwise treated like any other activity. So when we start calculating the dates, they're going to be treated like any other activity. The only exception is that their duration is zero. The reason for doing that is to show the logic so that it wouldn't be interrupted and to ensure that each activity has its own unique IJ node. So we would not have two activities with the same 10, 20, or 20, 30 name. Here, for example, 
activity 1020 and activity 1030 have the same successor 2040 how can we do that basically the nodes 20 and 30 are going to coincide so in order to do that we're going to separate these two nodes break them into two activities and add an arrow a dummy arrow that shows that activity 30 20 is going to precede activity 20 40 and so on and so forth so this is how we do the dummy activity however here we have something called a redundancy what is that redundancy what we're saying is that activity 1030 is going to be a predecessor to activity 2040 and that's shown through this dummy activity we're also saying that activity 1030 is a predecessor to activity 4060 but if activity 2040 is already a predecessor to 4060 then this arrow is totally redundant it does not need to be drawn so what we should do is erase this arrow because this is a redundant activity another problem with networks is and this is a fatal problem is loops loops are a circular logic so for example here we have activity 1020 and then 1020 leads to 2040 and then we say that activity we have 4020 so we're going back therefore what we have created here is a loop this is going to keep going and it can interrupt it's going to interrupt the calculations of the network you cannot have a network with a loop that's a fatal flaw no software no calculation is going to allow you to have such a loop so the loops are circular logic activities that circle or loop back onto themselves and these create fatal flaws which prevent accurate network calculations and this is the example some additional considerations as we mentioned the diagram should be drawn from left to right with arrowheads indicating the direction now once we know that the network always flows from left to right the arrowhead actually becomes redundant by itself because we know that it flows from left to right there's no need to put an arrowhead on the right side of that activity each node should be labeled with an alphanumeric identifier a1 number 34 whatever so basically another uh, a unique identifier when the arrows representing activities have to cross one of the arrows should be either broken or looped around that activity that's just a matter of drawing the network itself now once you start developing the network as a, a piece of advice uh, just like computer programmers when they write the code for a program they do not label the lines line 1 2 3 4 5 but they do them as line 10 20 30 40 50 why is that because later on if you want to insert an activity or in this case of a computer code if you want to uh, to insert a line a code line between activity 1 and 2 you don't have any space to do so but if you have labeled them 10 and 20 you have nine additional activities that can be inserted later on so that's a matter of uh, precaution when you are developing the network use labels like 10 20 30 40 etc because still this can be updated and modified and changed again here we have a an example that you can solve at home uh, draw the arrow network for the project given below again the dependencies and so on so we can do that once we have drawn the network now we need to start making the calculations because again the network shows just the flow of the activities if you remember from our first lecture about time management we said that time management is going to be done in several steps the first one is going to be activity definition so we're going to look at the big project and we're going to break it down into smaller entities or smaller activities work packages and then activities and the tool for that is going to be the work breakdown structure that's going to be our vehicle to break down the project into activities once we have developed that large list of activities we need to put them in a logical order what is going to be a predecessor to what what's going to be successor to what and so on and so forth so in this case the network is going to come very handy so far we don't have any durations yet we don't have any dates yet 
Therefore, the third step after defining the activities and putting them in the logical sequence is looking at determining the activity resources, what kind of resources are going to be needed, and the availability rates of these resources. So these resources can be material, can be equipment, can be subcontractor, or simply can be money that's going to pay for all of the above. Once we have developed the resource pool and the resource availability, now we can establish a duration for each activity. And the duration for the activity is going to be very simple. There's going to be one universal equation used to determine the duration of the activity. And that's a very simple equation. It's Q divided by P, or Q over P. Q is the quantity of work for that activity, and P is the production rate of the resources used in the activity. What if one activity has more than one resource with different production rates? The slowest resource, the one with the lowest production rate, is going to be the controlling factor. So if, for example, I have to place concrete, and placing the concrete is going to involve mixing the concrete in a batch plant, transporting the concrete to the construction site, pouring the concrete into the bucket of a tower crane, lifting the concrete to the seventh floor, and then placing that concrete through a group of personnel, of people, labor. Now the production of the batch plant can be 200 cubic yards an hour. Of these 200 cubic yards, I can only transport 50 cubic yards an hour. Of these 50 cubic yards an hour, I can only lift with the tower crane 30 cubic yards an hour. Of these 30 cubic yards, I can only place and finish 20 cubic yards an hour. Therefore, we have seen several resources with different production rates. The controlling production rate is going to be this, the lowest one, the 20 cubic yards an hour. Therefore, if I have 100 cubic yards to place, it's going to take 5 hours. 100 divided by 20, that gives 5 hours. So that's going to be the duration of the activity. Once we have established the durations of the activities, now we can start talking about network calculations and the dates, when should the activity start, when should it finish, and so on and so forth. So the objectives here are going to be to calculate the duration, to establish what's called the critical path, which is, I'm just going to give you a heads up here, the definition of the critical path is the longest continuous path through the network. Listen to the two critical words here, longest and continuous. It has to be, it will be the longest path and it has to be a continuous path through the network. And then we're going to talk about the activity float. We're going to define what float is and then talk about two different types of floats, total float and free float. The calculations are going to be done in two phases. One is going to be a motion from left to right from the beginning of the network to the end, which is going to be called following the natural flow of the network, therefore it's going to be called forward pass. And then once we reach the end of the network, we're going to go back to the beginning. So we're going to be retracing our steps backwards, and that's going to be moving from right to left against the flow of the network, and that's going to be called the backward pass. The combination of the forward pass and the backward pass is going to give us the network calculations to calculate the different dates for the different activities. Let's talk about the forward pass. The forward pass establishes the early start and the early finish dates of each activity and or the early node times for each activity. Remember, we mentioned that the nodes represent dates, events, start event, finish event, and each of these events has a date. So, The earliest start, which means the activity cannot start any earlier than that. And the early finish, sometimes also called earliest finish, means that the activity cannot finish any earlier than that. So to calculate the early dates, TE I is the early time at the node I of an activity IJ. So we have an activity IJ, which is in this case 3743. So TEI is the earliest time activity 3743 can start. The earliest time event I, which is 37, can happen. And similarly, 
TEJ is the earliest possible time for that activity to finish or the earliest date at node 43. Looking at this network here, we have several activities, several predecessors to this activity. And we might have different dates coming to these activities. So for example, I have activity 22 to 37, activities 27, 37, and activity 32, 37. Each one of them might be ending at a certain date. However, for node 37 to start, I have to wait for all the predecessors to happen. So if, for example, this activity here ended on day 10, and this one ended on day 12, and this one ended on day 14, I cannot start this one at day 10 because these two are not done yet. I cannot start at day 12 either because this one has not started and has not finished yet. So I have to wait until day 14 for all of these to be concluded in order to start this following activity. Therefore, the earliest start date for node 37 in this case would be day 14. If the duration of this activity is 5 days, then the finish is going to occur 5 days after the start. If the start was 14, then the finish is going to be day 19. It's as simple as that. Very simple math. So the whole trick here is that when we are talking about the earliest start is going to be the latest date of completion of the predecessor activities. Again, 10, 12, and 14, we have to start with 14. The early start of activity JK is going to be basically the same as the finish of activity IJ. The early finish is going to be the early start plus the duration. So what we said here, this is the early start. There's a duration here, five days. So the early finish is going to be early start plus duration. Now talking about the forward pass, the forward pass establishes the early start and the early finish. The early start is going to be designated as ES and the early finish is going to be designated as EF dates for each activity and or the early node times for each activity it's basically the same thing so TEI is the early time at the I node of an activity IJ and TEJ is the early time at its J node as we mentioned here TEJ maximum is equal to the early finishes of all the activities that terminate at node J so here, for example, if we have several activities, then this is going to be the latest of all of these dates. The TE of the first node of the network should be zero. So the start of the network is going to be at day zero, not day one. One of the common mistakes is to start at day one. We're always going to start at day zero where nothing has been done. All the relationships among activities are finish to start. There's no lag or delay, which means activity 2030 cannot start until activity 1020 has been fully complete. That's one of the drawbacks of uh, the arrow diagramming method as we're going to see. So again, now, the same network that we have drawn, what I want you to do is to add durations to this network and to start solving for the early start and the early finish of the different activities. And here's an example. So here we have activity 1020, 2100, 2050, 1040, and so on. Each activity has a name, so this is activity A, activity E, activity F, and each activity has a duration. The duration is going to be underneath the arrow. So activity 1020 or activity A has a duration of 10 days. Notice that we have some dummy activities. So we have here, for example, 2050 is a dummy activity. Therefore, we did not put a duration since the duration is going to be zero. Same here for 9100 and same for 6070. Any activity that does not have a duration is going to be denoted by a dotted line or dashed line. And that means it's a dummy activity. 
Now, looking at the calculations here, we're going to put a zero at the start of all of these three activities. So zero at node 10, which means zero at 1020, zero at 1040, and zero at 1030. At the node 20, we started with zero and we have a duration of 10 days. Therefore, the early finish of activity 1020 is going to be day 10, which means that at node 20, the date is 10, which means that any activity that starts after node 20 is going to start with 10. So here, 20 hundred is going to start on day 10, and so would activity 2050. Activity 1040 has four days of duration, therefore 0 plus 4, we're going to have 4 at the end of node 40. And activity 1030, 8 days duration, so basically we're going to have a an early finish of day 8. Therefore, we're going to start here with 8 plus 14, that's 22. We're going to have 22 here and here. 22 plus 4, that's 26. 22 plus 0, that's 22, and so on and so forth. I'd like you to keep doing this, noting that if I have two dates on coming to a node, I take the larger number. So here we have two merging activities, here we have two merging activities, and so we have here, here we have four merging activities. So the completion of the project at the end after node 110 is going to be the largest number coming from all of these four activities. And this is going to be the forward pass that's going to give us the early dates of the activities. To reverse that, we're going to do the backward pass. The backward pass is the exact opposite of the forward pass. Whatever we did in forward, we're going to reverse in backward. So in forward, we move from left to right, adding the durations of the activities. And in case we had two activities merging into one node, we took the larger number. On the backward pass, we're going to do the exact opposite. Starting from right to left, subtracting the durations of the activities. If two numbers merge into one node in the backward pass, we're going to take the smaller number to proceed backward. So the backward pass indicates the earliest dates on which each activity can be accomplished. The backward pass provides the late start and late finish dates for each activity without affecting the overall duration of the project. These dates are used in conjunction with the early dates to determine the criticality of each activity and its float, if any, as we're going to see in a moment. So the backward pass begins at the terminal or last activity works backward toward, backwards toward the beginning. The late finish, which is the late time at the no K node of activity JK, the late start is going to be late finish minus duration, the opposite of what we did in the forward pass. Uh, the late date at node K is going to be the minimum of the late starts of all activities following the, the node K. So if we have two activities merging into node K, we're going to take the smallest number, smaller number, and that's going to be transferred backward. The TL, the late dates of the last node of the network should be equal to the TE of the last node. So if we started the network with zero in the forward pass, we should end with zero in the backward pass. That's basically what it is. We're going to find that some activities have the same dates and some activities have different dates we're going to see that in a in a numerical example in a moment so for example if activity just looking at the numbers if activity 5070 had a start date of early start of 15 duration of 10 days early finish of 25 remember these numbers 15 and 25. Early start 15, early finish 25. In the backward pass, however, we got a different number. We got an early, f uh, a late finish of 28. Duration still 10. Therefore, the early start is going to be 18. In the forward pass, it was 15 and 25. In the backward pass, it was 18 and 28. So what we're saying here is that activity, this activity can start as early as day 15, or as late as day 18. It can start any time in between these two dates. If it starts on day 15, that's fine. If it starts on day 16, 17, or 18, that's fine. The project's still going to finish on time. 
Therefore, this activity has some flexibility or some leeway. And that leeway or flexibility we usually call float or to be more accurate, total float. So the total float is the leeway or the flexibility and it's the amount of time by which a non-critical activity can be delayed without delaying the project completion. Why are we saying non-critical? Because again, if that activity has this flexibility, it's not critical. Therefore, what is a critical activity? A critical activity is one that has the exact same dates. The early start is 15, the early finish is 25. The late start is also 15 and the late finish is also 25. So looking at the total float in this case, it's zero. It has to start on day 15, has to finish on day 25 in order for the project to be completed on time. Therefore, we call this activity critical. Therefore, the definition of a critical activity is an activity that has zero total float. The free float, on the other hand, is a subset of the total float, which means it can never exceed the total float. It's part of the total float. A part can, at its maximum, be equal to the whole. So at its maximum, the free float can be equal to the total float, but it cannot exceed the total float. Therefore, the free float is the amount of time. Look at the definition of total float and the slight difference with free float. In case of total float, we said amount of time a non-critical activity can be delayed without delaying the project completion. In case of free float, we say it's exactly the same first line. Amount of time a non-critical activity can be delayed without delaying, and here's the difference, any of its immediate successors. We're not looking as far as the completion of the project, we're just looking at the following activity, the immediate successor. Is it going to be delayed by the delay of this activity or not? If it's going to be delayed, therefore, the free float is zero, even if the activity has total float. If it's not going to be delayed, then in this case, the free float has a certain positive value. The free float, by the way, can never be negative. The minimum free float is zero. The maximum is going to be the exact amount of the total float. So for the calculations, again, the total float is equal to the late finish minus the early finish, or it can also be equal to late start minus early start. So it's always late minus early at the same end of the activity. If we look at the start side, it's late start minus start minus early start. If we look at the finish side, it's late finish minus early finish. Free float, on the other hand, is equal to the earliest early start of the activity minus of the, of the successor minus the early finish of the activity. So, for example, if our activity has an early finish of day 25 and the early start of its successor is day 28, how come? Because there was another activity that ended on day 28 and merged in the same node. So now we have two activities, one finishing on day 25, one finishing on day 28, merging in the same node. When should the successor start? We take the larger number. So we take 28. Therefore, for the first one that ends on, on day 25, it has three days of free float by which it can be delayed without delaying the start of its immediate successor. That's how free float works. There's something called interfering float. We're not going to focus on it, on it too much. It's basically the difference between the total float and the free float. It's that simple. We are not going to address it at all. I just wanted to inform you about it. So if you read about it or hear about it somewhere else, it has pretty much no practical use. Something called the interfering float. Now, with the same exercise that we've done before, I'd like you to draw the network. We have the dependencies in the third column. We have the durations. And now, I'd like you to calculate the early start, early finish, late start, late finish, total float, free float, and interfering float for that network. So what you're going to do after drawing the network and make doing the calculations, you're going to draw the table, and in that table you're going to add these seven columns. Early start, early finish, late start, late finish, total float, free float, and interfering float. Now let's start looking at some of the limitations of the activity on arrow network. One of the major limitations is that it shows only one type of relationships, which means one activity has to finish for its successor to start. You cannot have a lag, you cannot have an overlap between the activities, therefore it's all finished to start. 
and the issue of dummy activities. Sometimes it might be a little bit confusing if you're not used to it. So these are some of the limitations or the main drawbacks on activity on arrows. And by the way, activity on arrows are no longer used on a large scale, as we're going to see later on in the next lecture about another scheduling technique, another type of networks. This is the one that's more commonly used, but you have to learn about this one to be able to do the other one as well. As we're going to see that the calculations are pretty much the same. The question now is, that, and that's a very important question by the way, it's both a legal question and a technical question. Who owns the float? So if we say that an activity can be delayed by three days or five days or ten days, who can delay it? Is it the owner? Is it the architect engineer? Is it the construction manager? Is it the con general contractor? Is it the subcontractor? Is it the supplier? Who can delay the activity or basically who can utilize or who can use this float? The simple answer is it's on a first come first serve basis. Whoever needs it first can use it first. But each time you use part of the float, you leave less for someone else. So if, for example, the activity has 10 days of total float, the owner used three, then for all the other parties that are left, we only have seven days. If the engineer uses four, then we have only three remaining days. If the contractor used one, then we have only two days left for subcontractors, suppliers, etc. So the ownership of float should be carefully examined in every contract. For equitable risk allocation, we're going to say that the float is a shared property and it's a property of the project. Any party involved with the project can use the float as long as we still have some of it. An example of contract provisions. So the general statement is that the project owns the float unless otherwise stated in the contract. Here, for example, is, a, uh, is an example contract provision or clause. Float, sometimes referred to also as slack, is defined as the amount of time between the early start date and the late start date, or the early finish date and the late finish date. Of any of the activities in the schedule, float is not time for the exclusive use or benefit of either of the owner or the contractor. Extension of time for performance required under the contract clauses entitled changes, differing site conditions, termination for default, damages for delay, time extensions, or suspension of work will be granted only to the extent that equitable time adjustments for the activity or activities affected exceed the total float or slack. In simple English, the owner is not going to grant you any extension of time as long as the activity has float. The owner is only going to grant you an extension of time if the full float has been consumed and the activity has become critical and that was the fault of the owner or any of his agents. In this case, the owner is going to give the contractor an extension of time. However, if the contract has been delayed, the, the activity has been delayed and therefore the project has been delayed, due to an error of the general contractor or, or, or any of his agents, then in this case, the owner is not going to give the contractor any extension of time. On the other hand, the contractor may have to pay liquidated damages for the delay to the project. Some contractors submit late start time, thus hiding part of the float for their own use. So basically, the contractor would have several versions of the same schedule. On one version, they would give the owner that this activity is going to take 10 days to finish. On the inside, for their own internal use, they know that this activity is going to take only six days. So they have embedded four days of total float inside the activity without showing it to the owner. It is legal, but slightly unethical. Now, based on the arrow diagramming method, someone said, okay, why not add lines to the Gantt charts showing, because we mentioned that the Gantt chart or the bar chart does not show dependencies. So someone thought, why not show the dependencies through lines connecting the activities as we did with the network? And that should solve the issue. Now we have a graphical representation 
drawn to scale. By the way, the network is not drawn to scale. So the length of the arrow does not represent anything whatsoever. You can have two activities with exactly the same length of the arrow with two totally different durations. But in the GAN chart, they are drawn to scale. So the time-scaled network is a time-scaled diagram combining the principal features of the bar chart and the activity on arrow diagram. The bar chart that shows the activities drawn as a bar with a uh, relative length drawn to scale and the aspect from the activity on arrow showing the links or the relationships between the activities. The problem is that once you have a 500 schedule, 500 activity schedule, which is a relatively medium-sized schedule, it's going to be impossible to navigate through the lines. It's going to be a big spaghetti ball. The project is plotted on a horizontal time scale with arrows, vectors, and nodes representing activities and with arrow lengths representing time. That's the difference between time scaled and arrow. It's seldom used due to its illegibility for complex projects. Once again, you get to a complex project, it's very hard to read. That's how it looks. So basically, we have a time scale like the, the, uh, the GAN chart, and we have the nodes like the uh, arrow diagramming method, and then we have here the links connecting the activities and so on. So again, here we have made basically about uh, what seven activities. Imagine if that were 500 activities, it would be totally impossible to read it, especially when the lines start intersecting and things like that. That's another representation of that time scale network. And again, once you have so many activities, it's going to be really hard to read it. For someone who might consider it advantageous over the uh, arrow diagramming, it shows the activity sequence and order, and it shows the relative duration of the activities. Uh, the project plan and schedule can be shown together graphically. Project progress can be represented graphically as well. Disadvantages, use of dummy activities may be cumbersome, not easily modified, very awkward for large and complex projects, and still allows for only one type of relationships, which is finish to start. And that's the main drawback of arrow diagramming method. So we did not solve it in the time scaled diagram. Therefore, we are not going to worry at all about the time scaled network. We're not going to discuss it any further. We're just going to put an end to it right now. Now, if you want to go through the exercise and draw the time scaled network to see the interaction among the lines linking the different activities. And now we come to another sort of a philosophical discussion that has very practical implications on our schedule. The units of time. The units of time depend on the type of the project. In most of the projects, especially construction projects, the, the minimum increment unit of time is going to be a day. Therefore, we're going to say that this activity has a duration of 7 days, 9 days, 21 days, etc. However, on some very unique activities or some very unique projects, you might have the duration in minutes or in hours rather than days, especially if the project has a very short duration or in case the liquidated damages are very high. To give you an example, for the resurfacing of the main runway at O'Hare Airport, and that's a project that took place several years ago, O'Hare Airport is one of the busiest airports in the world. The contractor, you cannot shut off the, the whole airport just to surface, resurface the, uh, the runway. So it was divided into segments, allowing for parallel runways to be operating temporarily until you fix the, the main one. The contractor was given 14 days to finish the project, and the contractor was only allowed to work from midnight to 6 a.m., where the traffic is less dense than the rest of the day. The liquidated damages for that project were $25,000 an hour. So if the project is late by one hour, the contractor pays $25,000. Two hours, $50,000. So imagine, the contractor cannot plan based on days. A day is too long. A day is 25 times six hours, that's $150,000. Six hours because they only work six hours from midnight to 6 a.m. You cannot even 
scheduled by the hour because again $25,000 is a big chunk so the activities were drawn by the minute this activity is going to take 12 minutes this one is going to take 15 minutes this one 7 minutes and so on so in turnaround or plan shutdown work that's another example durations might be set in terms of shifts or even hours and minutes if the schedule is conceptual durations might be staged or stated in longer units such as weeks months or even years so I want to develop a new city now the new city is going to take seven years to develop or something like the Olympic Games I am planning for the Olympic Games eight years in advance I'm not going to say that on such and such day I'm going to install the light switch in the uh, dressing room of the swimming pool for example I cannot do that at the very beginning but I would say that the swimming pool should start in such on such and such date and finish on such and such date without putting much detail in between I just want some milestones or major events so in this case the duration might be in months or even in weeks for most typical construction schedules we're going to use days as a unit of time CPM days are work days plus one so the CPM day is also referred to as the morning of the project work day and also known as the ordinal dates and that that brings us back to the discussion why do we start the project on day zero and not on day one and if an activity has a duration of seven days and starts on day zero it ends on zero plus seven that's seven days shouldn't the following activity start the following day because we have reached the end of day seven we cannot do anything yet so we're going to wait until the morning of day eight therefore the start of the following activity is going to be on day eight that's going to be really confusing because when you look at one activity ending on day seven the following one starting on day eight where did they they go so from now on we're always going to discuss we're going to always calculate it based on the start of the day if we start on the morning of day zero add seven days let's count together zero that's day zero one two three four five six seven how many is that eight so let's do it again zero one two three four five six basically we miscounted let's do the counting again we start on day zero with the duration of seven days so zero one two three four five six how many fingers seven fingers what's the last number I counted six so how come zero plus seven is six no zero plus seven is seven but we're saying that this is the end of day number six which is the same as the beginning of day number seven so we're always gonna count from the beginning of the days so end of day six same as beginning of day number seven therefore zero plus seven is seven we ended the activity on the beginning of day number seven we're going to start its successor on the beginning of day number seven so the number at the end node is seven the number of the start of the following node is also seven so make sure you all you always measure from the start of the day to the start of the following day now these numbers that we are calculating are in work days because we did not include any holidays any weekends however sometimes the schedule or most of the time the schedule is, re is represented in calendar days so we need to make some modification if I have for example a five uh, day working week and the activity duration is 10 days then we're talking about two weeks so that's the conversion between calendar days and work days what is a work day unless otherwise specified the contractor will be permitted this is an example in a contract clause the contractor will be permitted to do the work between the hours of 7 45 a.m. to 4 30 p.m. Monday through Friday federal holidays that fall within the work week will not be considered work days prior to the contractor performing any work during hours other than those specified the contractor shall 
submit an overtime request to the owner's representative for review and approval. Overtime requests shall be submitted no less than 24 hours prior to the time the contractor designs, uh, de desires to work. So again, if you want to work out of the traditional work week, out of the traditional work day, you have to submit a request to the engineer for their approval. How about the effect of adverse weather conditions? So if we were supposed to work but there was a storm, for example, that um, forced us to shut down the work. It may be broadly defined to exclude weekends. Uh, um, a work day uh, may be broadly defined to exclude weekends, holidays, and those days on which no work can be performed. So for example, something like, like a storm that forced us to close every all the work on site, then in this case it's excluded from the calculations of the work days. What constitutes a day on which no work can be performed? A national holiday, weekend, unless stated otherwise, and other designated non-work days for maintenance and other purposes. So for example, we have the 4th of July, Christmas Day, Thanksgiving, uh, sometimes New Year's Day. These, are, these would be designated initially as non-work days in the calendar of the project so that you wouldn't include them in your workday calculations. Workdays versus calendar days. Now, when the owner says you have 200 days to finish this project, are we talking about workdays or calendar days? In most of the cases, unless stated otherwise, we're talking about calendar days. So you have to make that conversion. You have to retranslate these 200, work, these 200 days into their work equivalent by subtracting all the holidays and the weekends and so on. In general, if a project is vulnerable to the weather or if the weather can dramatically impact work progress, scheduling with work days is favorable. Then the owner might say, I'm going to give you 200 work days because we don't know we're going to be working in winter. We might have some interruptions. I, can, I cannot determine the, number of, uh, the, the exact date, so I'm going to give you 200 work days. In heavy construction, site work may be a significant component of the project and susceptible to ad adverse weather, as well as soil conditions, etc. Building construction may be less susceptible to weather because once you're done with the skeleton, most of the activities that take place indoors can be done any time of the day, any time of the year. Use of work days or calendars, the calendar days may be guided by the contract. So the contract is going to say whether that number of days is calendar days or work days. If not mentioned, it means calendar days. Certain project durations may be defined by a specific calendar date or milestone date. Again, that's going to be specified in the segment or the section in, this, uh, in the specifications talking about the schedule. The work days usually can be converted to calendar days or calendar days to work days. Uh, pros and concerns of using workday schedule is the project on track is the project not on track we will have to look at that one once we start performing calculations in the following lectures and now here's a uh, a problem for practice you have to draw a network an arrow network for the following project you have the activities dependencies or ipas and the have you have the durations of the activities you have to, now you are given the activity as only one designator, which is basically an IIJ. So you are given the, the name on the arrow and not the nodes. You have to come up with the names of the nodes. So calculate the duration of the project and calculate early start, early finish, late start, late finish, total float and free float on each activity. That's basically our discussion for today. You're going to find some solved examples on the web as well that show you how to solve these problems.